This begins the Dresden Files, written by Jim Butcher, published by Rock Fantasy. Each segment will consist of two chapters. Chapter 1. I heard the mailman approach my office door, half an hour earlier than usual. He didn't sound right. His footsteps fell jauntily, and he whistled. A new guy. He whistled his way to my office door, then fell silent for a moment. Then he laughed. Then he knocked. I winced. My mail comes through the mail slot unless it's registered. I get a really limited selection of registered mail and it's never good news. I got up out of my office chair and opened the door. The new mailman, who looked like a basketball with arms and legs and a sunburned, balding head, was chuckling at the sign on the door glass. He glanced at me and hooked a thumb toward the sign. You're kidding, right? I read the sign. People change it occasionally and shook my head. No, I'm serious. Can I have my mail, please? So, uh, like parties? Shows? Stuff like that? He looked past me as though he expected to see a white tiger or possibly some skimpily clad assistants prancing around my one-room office. I sighed, not in the mood to get mocked again, and reached for the mail he held in his hand. No, not like that. I don't do parties. He held on to it, and his head tilted curiously. So what? Some kind of fortune teller? Cards and crystal balls and things? No, I told him. I am not a psychic. I tugged at the mail. He held on to it. What are you, then? What does the sign on the door say? It says, Harry Dresden, wizard. That's me, I confirmed. An actual wizard, he asked, grinning as though I should let him in on the joke. Spells and potions, demons and incantations, subtle and quick to anger. Not so subtle. I jerked the mail out of his hand and looked pointedly at his clipboard. Can I sign for my mail, please? The new mailman's grin vanished, replaced with a scowl. He passed over the cl clipboard to let me sign for the mail, another late notice from my landlord, and said, You're a nut. That's what you are. He took his clipboard back and said, You have a nice day, sir. I watched him go. Typical, I muttered and shut the door. My name is Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden. Conjure by it at your own risk. I'm a wizard. I work out of an office in Midtown Chicago. As far as I know, I'm the only openly practicing professional wizard in the country. You can find me in the yellow pages under Wizards. Believe it or not, I'm the only one there. My ad looks like this. Harry Dresden, wizard. Lost items found, paranormal investigations, consulting, advice, reasonable rates, no love potions, endless purses, parties, or other entertainment. You'd be surprised how many people call just to ask me if I'm serious. But then if you'd seen the things I'd seen, if you knew half of what I knew, you'd wonder how anyone could not think I was serious. The end of the 20th century and the dawn of the new millennium had seen something of a renaissance in the public awareness of the paranormal. Psychics, haunts, vampires, you name it. People still didn't take them seriously, but all of the things science had promised us didn't come to pass. Disease was still a problem. Starvation was still a problem. Violence and crime and war were still problems. In spite of the advance of technology, things just hadn't changed the way everyone had hoped and thought they would. Science, the largest religion of the 20th century, had become somewhat tarnished by images of exploding space shuttles, crack babies, and a generation of complacent Americans who had allowed the television to raise their own children. People were looking for something. I think they just didn't know what. And even though they were once again starting to open their eyes to the world of magic and the arcane that had been with them all the while, they still thought I must be some kind of joke. Anyway, it had been a slow month. A slow pair of months, actually. My rent from February didn't get paid until the 10th of March. And it was looking like it might take even longer until I got caught up on this month. My only job had been the previous week when I'd gone down to Branson, Missouri, to investigate a country singer's possibly haunted house. It hadn't been. My client had not been happy with that answer, and had been even less happy when I suggested he lay off of any of the intoxicating substances and try to get some exercise and sleep, and see if that didn't help things more than an exorcism. I'd gotten travel expenses plus an hour's pay, and gone away feeling I had done the honest, righteous, and impractical thing. I heard later that he'd hired a shyster psychic to come in and perform a ceremony with a lot of incense and black lights. Some people. 
I finished up my paperback and tossed it into the done box. There was a pile of red and discarded paperbacks in a cardboard box on one side of my desk. The spines bent and the pages mingled. I'm terribly hard on books. I was eyeing the pile of unread books, considering which to start next, given that I had no real work to do when my phone rang. I stared at it in a somewhat surly fashion. We wizards are terrific at brooding. After the third ring, when I thought I wouldn't sound a little too eager, I picked up the receiver and said, Dresden. Oh, is this, uh, Harry Dresden? The, uh, wizard? Her tone was apologetic, as though she were terribly afraid she had insulted me. No, I thought, it's Harry Dresden, the, uh, lizard. Harry the wizard is one door down. It is the prerogative of wizards to be grumpy. It is not, however, the prerogative of freelance consultants who are late on their rent. So instead of saying something smart, I told the woman on the phone, Yes, ma'am. How can I help you today? I, um, she said, I'm not sure. I've lost something, and I think maybe you could help me. Finding lost articles is a specialty, I said. What would I be looking for? There was a nervous pause. My husband, she said. She had a voice that was a little hoarse, like that of a cheerleader who had been working a long tournament but had enough weight of years in it to place her as an adult. My eyebrows went up. Ma'am, I'm not really a missing persons specialist. Have you contacted the police or a private investigator? No, she said quickly. No, they can't. That is, I haven't. Oh dear, this is all so complicated. Not something someone can talk about on the phone. I'm sorry to have taken up your time, Mr. Dresden. Hold on now. I said quickly. I'm sorry, you didn't tell me your name. There was that nervous pause again, as though she were checking a sheet of written notes before answering. Call me Monica. People who know diddly about wizards don't like to give us their names. They're convinced that if they give a wizard their name from their own lips, it could be used against them. To be fair, they're right. I had to be as polite and harmless as I could. She was about to hang up out of pure indecision, and I needed the job. I could probably turn hubby up if I worked at it. Okay, Monica. Okay, Monica. I told her, trying to sound as melodious and friendly as I could. If you feel your situation is of a sensitive nature, maybe you could come by my office and talk about it. If it turns out that I can help you best, I will. And if not, then I can direct you to someone I think can do better. I gritted my teeth and pretended I was smiling. No charge. It must have been the no charge that did it. She agreed to come right out to the office and told me that she would be there in an hour. That put her estimated arrival at about 2.30, plenty of time to go out and get some lunch, then get back to the office to meet her. The phone rang again, almost the instant I put it down, making me jump. I peered at it. I don't trust electronics. Anything manufactured after the 40s is suspect and doesn't seem to have much liking for me. You name it, cars, radios, telephones, TVs, VCRs, none of them seem to behave well for me. I don't even like to use automatic pencils. I answered the phone with the same false cheer I had summoned up for Monica, husband missing. This is Dresden. May I help you? Harry, I need you at the Madison in the next ten minutes. Can you be there? The voice on the other end of the line was also a woman's cool, brisk, businesslike. Why, Lieutenant Murphy, I gushed, overflowing with saturin. It's good to hear from you, too. It's been so long. Oh, they're fine. And your family? Save it, Harry. I've got a couple bodies here, and I need you to take a look around. Now. I sobered immediately. Karen Murphy was the director of special investigations out of downtown Chicago, a de facto appointee of the police commissioner to investigate any crimes dubbed as unusual. Vampire attacks, troll maraudings, and fairy abductions of children didn't fit in very neatly on a police report. But at the same time, people get attacked, infants got stolen, property was damaged or destroyed, and someone had to look into it. In Chicago, or pretty much anywhere in Chicagoland, that person was Karen Murphy. I was her library of the supernatural on legs, and a paid consultant for the police department. But two bodies, two deaths by means unknown, I hadn't handled anything like that for her before. Where are you? I asked her. Madison Hotel on 10th, 7th floor. That's only a 15 minute walk from my office, I said. So you can be here in 15 minutes? Good. Um, I said. I looked at the clock. Monica, no last name, would be here in a little over 45 minutes. 
I've sort of got an appointment already. Dresden, I've sort of got a pair of corpses with no leads and no suspects and a killer walking around loose. Your appointment can wait. My temper flared. It does this occasionally. It can't, actually, I said. But I'll tell you what. I'll stroll on over and take a look around and be back here in time for you. Have you had lunch yet? She asked. What? She repeated the question. No, I said. Don't. There was a pause, and when she spoke again, there was a sort of greenish tone to her words. It's bad. How bad are we talking here, Murph? Her voice softened, and that scared me more than any images of gore or violent death could have. Murphy was the original tough girl, and she prided herself on never showing weakness. It's bad, Harry. Please don't take too long. Special Crimes is itching to get their fingers on this one, and I know you don't like people to touch the scene before you can look around. I'm on my way, I told her, already standing and pulling on my jacket. Seventh floor, she reminded me. See you there. Okay. I turned off the lights to my office, went out the door, and locked up behind me, frowning. I wasn't sure how long it was going to take to investigate Murphy's scene, and I didn't want to miss out on speaking with Monica, ask me no questions. So I opened the door again, got out a piece of paper and a thumbtack, and wrote, Out briefly. Back for appointment at 2.30. Dresden. That done, I started down the stairs. I rarely use the elevator, even though I'm on the fifth floor. Like I said, I don't trust machines. They're always breaking down on me, just when I need them. Besides which, if I were someone in this town using magic to kill people two at a time, and I didn't want to get caught, I'd make sure that I removed the only practicing wizard the police department kept on retainer. I liked my odds on the stairwell a lot better than I did in the cramped confines of the elevator. Paranoid? Probably. But just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that there isn't an invisible demon about to eat your face off. Chapter 2 Karen Murphy was waiting for me outside the Madison. Karen and I are a study in contrasts. Where I am tall and lean, she is short and stocky. Where I have dark hair and dark eyes, she's got Shirley Temple blonde locks and baby blues. Where my features are all lean and angular, with a hawkish nose and a sharp chin. Hers are round and smooth, with the kind of cute nose you'd expect on a cheerleader. It was cool and windy, like it usually is in March, and she wore a long coat that covered her pantsuit. Murphy never wore dresses, though I suspected she'd have muscular, well-shaped legs, like a gymnast. She was built for function, and had a pair of trophies in her office from Aikido tournaments to prove it. Her hair was cut at shoulder length and whipped out wildly in the spring wind. She wasn't wearing earrings, and her makeup was of sufficient quality and quantity that it was tough to tell she had any on at all. She looked more like a favorite aunt or a cheerful mother than a hard-bitten homicide detective. Don't you have any other jackets, Dresden? She asked as I came within calling distance. There were several police cars parked illegally in front of the building. She glanced at my eyes for half a second and then away quickly. I had to give her credit. It was more than most people did. It wasn't really dangerous unless you did it for several seconds, but I was used to anyone who knew I was a wizard making it a point not to glance at my face. I looked down at my black canvas duster with its heavy mantling and waterproof lining, and sleeves actually long enough for my arms. What's wrong with this one? It belongs on the streets of El Dorado. And? She snorted, an indelicate sound from so small a woman, and spun on her heel to walk toward the hotel's front doors. I caught up and walked a little ahead of her. She sped her pace, and so did I. We raced one another toward the front door, with increasing speed, through the puddles left over from last night's rain. My legs were longer. I got there first. I opened the door for her, and gallantly gestured for her to go in. It was an old contest of ours. Maybe my values are outdated, but I come from an old school of thought. I think that men ought to treat women like something other than just shorter, weaker men with breasts. Try and convince me if I'm a bad person for thinking so. I enjoy treating a woman like a lady, opening doors for her, paying for shared meals, giving flowers, all that sort of thing. It irritates the hell out of Murphy, who had to fight and claw and play dirty with the hairiest men in Chicago to get as far as she has. She glared up at me while I stood there, holding open the door. But there was a reassurance about the glare, a relaxation. She took an odd sort of comfort in our ritual, annoying as she usually found it. How bad was it on the seventh floor, anyways? We rode the elevator in a sudden silence. We knew one another well enough by this time that the silences were not uncomfortable. 
I had a good sense of Murphy, an instinctual grip, an instinctual grasp for her moods and patterns of thought, something I develop whenever I'm around someone for any length of time. Whether it's a natural talent or a supernatural one, I don't know. My instincts told me that Murphy was tense, stretched as tight as piano wire. She kept it off her face, but there was something about the set of her shoulders and neck, the stiffness of her back that made me aware of it. Or maybe I was projecting it onto her. The confines of the elevator made me a bit nervous. I licked my lips and looked around the interior of the car. My shadow and Murphy's fell on the floor and almost looked as though they were sprawled there. There was something about it that bothered me, a nagging little instinct that I blew off as a case of nerves. Steady Harry. She let out a harsh breath just as the elevator slowed, then sucked in another one before the doors could open, as though she were planning on holding it for as long as we were on the floor and breathing only when she got back to the elevator again. Blood smells a certain way, a kind of sticky, almost metallic odor, and the air was full of it when the elevator doors opened. My stomach quailed a little bit, but I swallowed manfully and followed Murphy out of the elevator and down the hall past a couple of uniformed cops, who recognized me and waved me past without asking to see the little laminated card the city had given me. Granted, even in a big city of department, like Chicago PD, they didn't exactly call in a horde of consultants. I went down in the paperwork as a psychic consultant, I think. But still, unprofessional of the boys in blue. Murphy preceded me into the room. The smell of blood grew thicker, but there wasn't anything gruesome behind door number one. The outer room of the suite looked like some kind of a sitting room done in rich tones of red and gold, like a set from an old movie in the 30s. Expensive looking, but somehow faux, nonetheless. Dark, rich leather covered the chairs, and my feet sank into the thick, rust-colored shag of the carpet. The velvet velour curtains had been drawn, and though the lights were all on, the place still seemed a little too dark, a little too sensual in its textures and colors. It wasn't the kind of room where you sit and read a book. Voices came from a doorway to my right. Wait here a minute, Murphy told me. There she went through the door to the right of the entryway, and into what I supposed was the bedroom of the suite. I wandered around the sitting room with my eyes mostly closed, noting things. Leather couch. Two leather chairs. Stereo and television in a black, glossy entertainment center. Champagne bottle warming in a stand holding a brimming tub of what had been ice the night before, with two empty glasses set beside it. There was a red rose petal on the floor, clashing with the carpeting. But then, in that room, what didn't? A bit to one side, under the skirt of one of the leather recliners, was a little piece of satiny cloth. I bent at the waist and lifted the skirt with one hand, careful not to touch anything. A pair of black satin panties. A tiny triangle of lace coming off the points lay there. One strap snapped as though the thong had simply been torn off. Kinky. The stereo system was state-of-the-art, though not an expensive brand. I took a pencil from my pocket and pushed the play button with the eraser. Gentle, sensual music filled the room. A low bass, a driving drumbeat, wordless vocals, the heavy breathing of a woman as background. The music continued for a few seconds more, and then it began to skip over a section about two seconds long, repeating it over and over again. I grimaced. Like I said, I have this effect on machinery. It has something to do with being a wizard, with working with magical forces. The more delicate and modern the machine is, the more likely it is that something will go wrong if I get close enough to it. I can kill a cop here at fifty paces. The love, sweet, came a man's voice, drawing the word love into love. What do you think, Mr. Man? Hello, Detective Carmichael, I said without turning around. Carmichael's rather light and nasal voice had a distinctive quality. He was Murphy's partner and the resident skeptic, convinced that I was nothing more than a charlatan, scamming the city out of its hard-earned money. Were you saving the panties to take home yourself, or did you just overlook them? I turned and looked at him. He was short, overweight, and balding, with beady, bloodshot eyes and a weak chin. His jacket was rumpled, and there were food stains on his tie, all of which served to conceal a razor intellect. He was a sharp cop, and absolutely ruthless in tracking down killers. He walked over to the chair and looked down. Not bad, Sherlock he said, but that's just foreplay. Wait till you see the main attraction. I'll have a bucket waiting for you. He turned and killed the malfunctioning CD player with a jab from the eraser end of his own pencil. 
I widened my eyes at him to let him know how terrified I was, then walked past him and into the bedroom, and regretted it. I looked, noted details mechanically, and quietly shut the door on the part of my head that had started screaming the second I entered the room. They must have died sometime during the night before, as rigor mortis had already set in. They were on the bed. She was astride him. Body leaned back. Back bowed out like a dancer's, the curves of her breasts making a lovely outline. He stretched beneath her, a lean and powerfully built man, arms reaching out and grasping at the satin sheets, gathering them in his fists. Had it been an erotic photograph, it would have made a striking tableau. Except that the lover's rib cages on the upper left side of their torsos had expanded outward, through their skin, the ribs jabbing out like jagged, snapped knives. Arterial blood had sprayed out of their bodies, all the way to the mirror on the ceiling, along with pulped, gelatinous masses of flesh that had to be what remained of their hearts. Standing over them, I could see into the upper cavity of the bodies. I noted the now grayish, grayish lining around the motionless left lungs and the edges of the ribs, which apparently were forced outward and snapped by some force within. It definitely cut down on the erotic potential. The bed was in the middle of the room, giving it a subtle emphasis. The bedroom followed the, de the decor of the sitting room. A lot of red, a lot of plush fabrics, a little over the top and less viewed in candlelight. There were indeed candles and holders on the wall, now burned down to the nubs and extinguished. I stepped closer to the bed and walked around it. The carpet squelched as I did, the little screaming part of my brain, safely locked up behind doors of self-control and strict training, continued gibbering. I tried to ignore it. Really, I did. But if I didn't get out of that room in a hurry, I was going to start crying, like a little girl. So I took in the details fast. The woman was in her twenties, in fabulous condition. At least, I thought she had been. It was hard to tell. She had hair the color of chestnuts, cut in a pageboy style, and it seemed dyed to me. Her eyes were only partly open, and I couldn't quite guess at their color beyond not dark. Vaguely green, maybe? The man was probably in his forties and had the kind of fitness that comes from a lifetime of conditioning. There was a tattoo on his right bicep, a winged drag dagger that the pole of the satin sheets half concealed. There were scars on his knuckles, layers deep, and across his lower abdomen was a vicious, narrow, puckered scar that I guessed must have come from a knife wound. There were discarded clothes around, a tux for him, a little sheath of a black dress, and a pair of pumps for her. There were a pair of overnight bags, unopened and set neatly aside, probably by a porter. I looked up. Carmichael and Murphy were watching me in silence. I shrugged at them. Well? Murphy demanded. Are we dealing with magic here, or aren't we? Either that, or it was some really incredible sex, I told her. Carmichael snorted. I laughed a little, too. And that was all the screaming part of my brain needed to slam open the doors I'd shut on it. My stomach revolted and heaved. I lurched out of the room. Carmichael, true to his word, had set a stainless steel bucket outside the room, and I fell to my knees, throwing up. It only took me a couple seconds to control myself again, but I did not want to go back into that room. I didn't need to see what was in there anymore. I didn't want to see the two dead people, whose hearts had literally exploded out of their chests, and someone had used magic to do it. They had used magic to wreak harm on another, violating the first law. The White Council was going to go into collective apoplexy. This hadn't been the act of a malign spirit or malicious entity, or the attack of one of the many creatures of the never-never like vampires or trolls. This had been the premeditated, deliberate act of a sorcerer or wizard, or human being able to tap into the fundamental energies of creation and life itself. It was worse than murder. It was twisted, wretched perversion as though someone had bludgeoned another person to death with a Botticelli, turned something of beauty to an utter act of utter destruction. If you've never touched it, it's hard to explain. Magic is created by life, most of all by the awareness, intelligence, emotions of a human being. To end such a life with the same magic that was born from it was hideous, almost incestuous, somehow. I sat up again and was breathing hard, shaking and tasting the bile in my mouth, when Murphy came back out of the room with Carmichael. All right, Harry, Murphy said. Let's have it. What do you see happening here? I took a moment to collect my thoughts before answering. They came in. They had some champagne. They danced for a while. 
made out over there by the stereo, then went into the bedroom. They were in there for less than an hour. It hit them when they were getting to the high point. Less than an hour, Carmichael said. How do you figure? CD was only an hour and ten long. Figure a few minutes for dancing and drinking, and then they're in the room. Was the CD playing when they found them? No, Murphy said. Then it hadn't been set on a loop. I figured they wanted music just to make things perfect, given the room and all. Carmichael grunted sourly. Nothing we hadn't already figured out for ourselves, he said to Murphy. He'd better come up with more than this. Murphy shot Carmichael a look that said, Shut up. Then said softly, I need more, Harry. I ran one of my hands back over my hair. There's only two ways anyone could have managed this. The first is by evocation. Evocation is the most direct, spectacular, and noisy form of expressed magic, or sorcery. Explosions, fire, that sort of thing. But I doubt it was an evocator who did this. Why? Murphy demanded. I heard her pencil scritching on the notepad she always kept with her. Because you have to be able to see or touch where you want your effect to go, I told her. Line of sight only. The man or woman would have had to have been there in the room with them. Tough to hide forensic evidence with something like that. And anyone who is skilled enough to pull off a spell like that would have had the sense to use a gun instead. It's easier. What's the other option? Murphy asked. Thaumaturgy, I said. As above, so below. Make something happen on a small scale and give it the energy to happen on a large scale. Carmichael snorted. What bullshit. Murphy's voice sounded skeptical. How would that work, Harry? Could it be done from somewhere else? I nodded. The killer would have ne the killer would need to have something to connect him or her to the victims. Hair, fingernails, blood samples, that sort of thing. Like a voodoo doll? Exactly, yes, the same thing. There's fresh dye in the woman's hair, Murphy said. I nodded. Maybe if you can find out where she got her hair styled, you can find something out. I don't know. Is there anything else you could tell me that would be of use? Yes, the killer knew the victims, and I'm thinking it was a woman. Carmichael snorted. I don't believe we got to sit here and listen to this. Nine times out of ten, the killer knows the victim. Shut up, Carmichael, Murphy said. What makes you say that, Harry? I stood up and rubbed at my face with my hands. The way magic works. Whenever you do something with it, it comes from inside of you. Wizards have to focus on what they're trying to do. Visualize it. Believe in it to make it work. You can't make something happen that isn't a part of you inside. The killer could have murdered them both and made it look like an accident, but she did it this way. To get it done this way, she would have had to have wanted them dead for a very personal reason. To be willing to reach inside them like that? Revenge, maybe? Maybe you're looking for a lover, or a spouse. Also because of when they died, in the middle of sex. It wasn't a coincidence. Emotions are a kind of channel for magic. A path that can be used to get to you. She picked a time when they'd be together, and be charged up with lust. She got samples to use as a focus, and she planned it out in advance. You don't do that to strangers. Crap, Carmichael said, but this time it was more of an absent-minded curse than anything directed at me. Murphy glared at me. You keep saying she. She challenged me. Why the hell do you think that? I gestured toward the room. Because you don't do something that bad without a whole lot of hate, I said. Women are better at hating than men. They can focus it better, let it go better. Hell, witchers are just plain meaner than wizards. This feels like feminine vengeance of some kind to me. But a man could have done it, Murphy said. Well, I hedged. Christ, you are a chauvinist pig, Dresden. Is it something that only a woman could have done? Well, no, I don't think so. You don't think so? Carmichael drawled. Some expert. I scowled at them both, angry. I haven't really worked through the specifics of what I need to do to make somebody's heart explode, Murph. As soon as I have occasion to, I'll be sure to let you know. When will you be able to tell me something? Murphy asked. I don't know. I held up a hand, forestalling her next comment. I can't put a timer on this stuff, Murph. It just can't be done. I don't even know if I can do it at all, much less how long it will take. At fifty bucks an hour, it better not take too long, Carmichael growled. Murphy glanced at him. She didn't exactly agree with him, but she didn't exactly slap him down, either. I took the opportunity to take a few long breaths, calming myself down. I finally looked back at them. Okay, I asked. Who are they? The victims. You don't need to know that, Carmichael snapped. Ron, Murphy said. I could really use some coffee. Carmichael turned to her. 
He wasn't tall, but he was all, but he all but loomed over Murphy. Aw, oh, come on, Murph. This guy's jerking your chain. You don't really think he's going to be able to tell you anything worth hearing, do you? Murphy regarded her partner's sweaty, beady-eyed face with a sort of frosty hauteur, tough to pull off on someone six inches taller than she. No cream, two sugars. Damn it, Carmichael said. He shot me a cold glance, but didn't quite look at my eyes, then jammed his hands into his pants pockets and stalked out of the room. Murphy followed him to the door, her feet silent and shut it behind him. The sitting room immediately became darker, closer, with the grinning ghouls of its former chintzy intimacy dancing in the smell of the blood and the memory of the two bodies in the next room. The woman's name is Jennifer Stanton. She worked for the Velvet Room. I whistled. The Velvet Room was a high-priced escort service, run by a woman named Bianca. Bianca kept a flock of beautiful, charming, and witty women, pandering them to the richest men in the area for hundreds of dollars an hour. Bianca sold the kind of female company that most men only see on television and the movies. I also knew that she was a vampiress of considerable influence in the Never Never. She had power with a capital P. I tried to explain the Never Never to Murph before, but she didn't really comprehend it. But she did understand that Bianca was a badass vampiress who sometimes squabbled for territory. We both knew that if one of Bianca's girls was involved, the vampiress must have been involved somehow, too. Murphy cut right to the point. Was this part of one of Bianca's territorial disputes? No, I said. Unless she's having a human sorcerer, a vampire, even a vamp sorcerer, couldn't have pulled off something like this outside of the Never Never. Could she be at odds with a human sorcerer? Murphy asked me. Possible, but it doesn't sound like her. She isn't that stupid. What I didn't tell Murphy was that the White Council made sure that vampires who trifled with mortal, mortal practitioners never lived to brag about it. I don't talk to regular people about the White Council. It just is not done. Besides, I said, if a human wanted to take a shot at Bianca by hitting her girls, he'd be better off to kill the girl and leave the customer healthy to let him spread the tail and scare off business. Hmm, Murphy said. She wasn't convinced, but she made notes of what I had said. Who is the man? I asked her. Murphy looked up at me for a moment, then said evenly, Tommy Tom. I blinked at her to let her know that she hadn't revealed the mystery of the ages. Who? Tommy Tom, she said. Johnny Marcone's bodyguard. Now it made sense. Gentleman Johnny Marcone had been the thug to emerge on top of the pile after the Vargasi family had dissolved into internal strife. The police department saw Marcone as a mixed blessing. After years of merciless struggle and bloody exchanges with the Vargasis, Gentleman Johnny tolerated no excesses in his organization, and he didn't like freelancers operating in his city. Muggers, bank robbers, and drug dealers who were not a part of his organization somehow always seemed to get ratted out and turned in, or simply went missing and weren't heard from again. Marcone was a civilizing influence on crime, and where he operated, it was more of a problem in terms of scale than ever before. An extremely shrewd businessman, he had a battery of lawyers working for him that kept him fenced in from the law behind a barricade of depositions and paper and tape recordings. The cops never said it, but sometimes it seemed like they were almost reluctant to chase him. Marcone was better than the alternative, anarchy in the underworld. I remember hearing he had an enforcer, I said. I guess he doesn't anymore. Murphy shrugged. So it would seem. So what will you do next? Run down this hairstylist angle, I guess. I'll talk to Bianca and to Marcone, but I can already tell you what they'll tell me. She flicked her notebook closed and shook her head, irritated. I watched her for a minute. She looked tired. I told her so. I am tired, she replied. Tired of being looked at like I'm some kind of nutcase. Even Carmichael with my own partner. Even Carmichael, my own partner, thinks I've gone over the edge on all of this. The rest of the station thinks so too? I asked her. Most of them just scowl and spin their index phase fingers around their temples when they think I'm not looking, and file my reports without ever reading them. The rest of the ones who have run into something spooky out there, and they're scared shitless. They don't want to believe in anything they didn't see on Mr. Science when they were kids. What about you? Me. Murphy smiled, a curving of her lips that was a vibrantly feminine expression, making her look entirely too pretty to be such a hard-ass. The world's falling apart at the seams, Harry, 
I guess I just think people are pretty arrogant to believe we'll have re we've learned everything there is to know in the past century or so. What the hell? I can buy that we're just now starting to see the things around us in the dark again. It appeals to the cynic in me. I wish everyone thought like you do, I said. It would cut down on my crank calls. She continued to smile at me, impish. But could you imagine a world where all the radio stations played ABBA? We shared a laugh. God, that room needed a laugh. Hey, Harry, Murphy said, grinning. I could see the wheel spinning in her head. Yeah? What you said about being able to figure out how the killer did this. About how you're not sure you can do it. Yeah? I know it's bullshit. Why did you lie to me about it? I stiffened. Christ, she was good. Or maybe I'm just not much of a liar. Look, Murph, I said. There's some things you just don't do. Sometimes... I don't want to get into the head of the slime I go after either, but you do what needs to be done to finish the job. I know what you mean, Harry. No, I said shortly. You don't know. She didn't know about my past, or the White's Council, or the doom of Damocles that hung over my head. Most days I could pretend I didn't know about it either. All the Council needed now was an excuse, just an excuse to find me guilty of violating one of the seven laws of magic, and the doom would drop. If I started putting together a recipe for a murder spell, and they found out about it, that might be all the excuse they needed. Murph, I told her, I can't try figuring this spell out. I can't go putting together the things I'd need to do it. You just do not understand. She glared at me, without looking at my eyes. I hadn't ever met anyone else who could pull that off. Oh, I understand. I understand that I've got a killer loose, one that I can't catch in the act. I understand that you know something that can help, or you can at least find out something. And I understand that if you dry up on me now, I'm tearing your card out of the department Rolodex and tossing it in the trash. Son of a bitch. My consulting for the department paid a lot of my bills. Okay, the vast majority of my bills. I could sympathize with her, I supposed. If I was operating in the dark like she was, I'd be nervous as hell too. Murphy didn't know anything about spells, or rituals, or talismans. But she knew human hatred and violence all too well. It wasn't as though I was actually going to be doing any black magic, I told myself. I was just going to be figuring out how it was done. There was a difference. I was helping the police in an investigation, nothing more. Maybe the White Council would understand that. Yeah, right. And maybe one of these days, I'd go to an art museum and become well-rounded. Murphy set the hook a second later. She looked up at my eyes for a daring second before she turned away, her face tired and honest and proud. I need to know everything you can tell me, Harry. Please. Classic lady in distress. For one of those liberated professional women, she knew exactly how to jerk my old-fashioned chains around. I grated my teeth. Fine, I said. Fine. I'll start on it tonight. Oh boy, the White Council was going to love this one. I just have to make sure they didn't find out about it. Murphy nodded and let out a breath without looking at me. Then she said, Let's get out of here, and walked toward the door. I did not try to beat her to it. When we walked out, the uniformed cops were still lazing around in the hall outside. Carmichael was nowhere to be seen. The guys from forensics were there, standing around impatiently, waiting for us to come out. Then they gathered up their plastic bags and tweezers and lights and things and filed past us into the room. Murphy was brushing at her wind-blown hair with her hand, while we waited for the ancient elevator to take its sweet time getting up to the seventh floor. She was wearing a gold watch, which reminded me. Oh, hey, I asked her. What time is it? She checked. 2.25. Why? I breathed out a curse and turned for the stairs. I'm late for my appointment. I fairly flew down the stairs. I've had a lot of practice at them, after all, and I hit the lobby at a jog. I managed to dodge a porter coming through the front doors with an armload of luggage, and swung out onto the sidewalk at a lope. I have long legs that eat a lot of ground. I was running into the wind, my black duster billowing out behind me. It was several blocks to my building, and after covering half of them, I slowed to a walk. I didn't want to arrive at my appointment with Monica Missing Man puffing like a bellows, with my hair wind-blown and my face streaming with sweat. Blame it on being out of shape from an inactive winter season. But I was breathing hard. It occupied enough of my attention that I didn't see the dark blue Cadillac until it had pulled up beside me, and a rather large man had stepped out onto the sidewalk in front of me. 
He had bright red hair and a thick neck. His face looked like someone had smashed it flat with a board repeatedly when he was a baby, except for his jutting eyebrows. He had narrow little blue eyes that got narrower as I sized him up. I stopped and backed away, then turned around. Two more men, both of them as tall as me and a good deal heavier, were slowing down from their own jog. They had apparently been following me, and they looked annoyed. One was limping slightly, and the other wore a buzz cut that had been spiked up straight with some kind of styling gel. I felt like I was in high school again, surrounded by bullying members of the football team. Can I help you, gentlemen? I asked. I looked around for a cup, but they were all over at the Madison, I supposed. Everyone likes to gawk. Get in the car, the one in front of me said. One of the others opened the door in front of me. I like to walk. It's good for my heart. You don't get in the car, it isn't going to be good for your legs. A voice came from inside the car. Mr. Hendricks, please, be more polite. Mr. Dresden, would you join me for a moment? I'd hoped to give you a lift back to your office, but your abrupt exit made it somewhat problematic. Perhaps you will allow me to convey you the rest of the way. I leaned down to look into the back seat. A man of handsome and unassuming features dressed in a casual sports jacket and Levi's regarded me with a smile. And you would be? I asked him. His smile widened, and I swear it made his eyes twinkle. My name is Johnny Marcone. I would like to discuss business with you. I stared at him for a moment, and then my eyes slid aside to the very large and very overdeveloped Mr. Hendricks. The man growled under his breath, and it sounded like Cujo just before he jumped at the woman in the car. I didn't feel like duking it out with Cujo and his two buddies. So I got into the back of the caddy with Gentleman Johnny Marcane. It was turning out to be a very busy day, and I was still late for my appointment. This concludes chapter two. Thank you for listening, and remember, have a good day. You deserve it.